your introduction. I hope you will enjoy these uh, poems. Uh, poems can do many, many things, but I think the first obligation of a poem, and the first and last obligation, is to give pleasure. Um, too many poets these days have forgotten that. Um, I'm, I want to read mostly new poems, recent poems, but I thought I would begin with uh, two or three old ones. Um, the first one is called, I'm the right book, uh, Tea Dance at the Nautil Nautilus Hotel. Uh, Robert Frost once said that the utmost of ambition for a poet would be to lodge the poem where it would be hard to get rid of. Uh, that kind of luck does not, most poets would, uh, will never, never do that. Um, but I sometimes think if I, if I should be so lucky, this is probably the one poem that, that might last a while. Uh, tea Dance at the Nautilus Hotel, it's a, it's a response to and uh, in some ways interpretation of a watercolor painting by Donald Justice. I don't know if, if you know his work, but if you don't, you should go buy his book. I think he was the best American poet for the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, he was a painter as well, uh, an amateur, but a good, a good one. Now, the, I have to explain a couple of things briefly. The tea dance, most of you look too young to know what it was. Uh, it was a big dance, uh, very popular in the 20s and 30s. Um, great, some great musicians came to play, for, uh, uh, Benny Goodman, uh, Glenn Miller, Tommy Dorsey. And uh, it was called tea dance because tea was the beverage that was offered. Needless to say, there were other beverages <laughs> which is stronger. Uh, the Nautilus Hotel is a hotel on Miami Beach. And 1925 is the year of Justice's birth. So he was not painting this from life. Uh, I think he had a photograph of what the hotel used to look like in those days. And it's look, looking down at an, out, an outdoor dance floor with tables, with parasols, and couples. <coughs> and I also used a word that not, not everybody uh, knows, a panatella, uh, if you don't know, it is a, a little thin cigar. Tea Dance at the Nautilus Hotel, 1925. The gleam of eyes under the striped umbrellas, we see them still after so many years, or think we do. The young men and their dears, bandying forward glances as through masks in the curled bluish haze of panatellas and taking nips from little silver flasks. They sit at tables as the sun is going, bent over cigarettes and lukewarm tea, talking small talk, gossip and gallantry, some of them single, some husbands and wives, laughing and telling stories. All unknowing, they sit here in the heyday of their lives. And some then dance off in the late sunlight, lips brushing cheeks, hands growing warm in hands, feet gliding at the lightest of commands. All summer, on their caught or sighing breath, as they whirl on toward the oncoming night, and nothing further from their thoughts than death. But they danced here 65 years ago. Almost all of them must be underground. Who could be left to smile at the sound of the old fangled dance tunes and each pair of youthful lovers swaying to and fro? Only a dreamer who was never there. I'm going to mix in with uh, my, my poems uh, a few translations of the Borges. Um, 
most of you probably know Borges as a writer, writer of fic short fiction. That's his, that's his reputation. But he thought of himself first and last as a poet. And I think he was one of the three or four greatest poets of the century. Um, my late friend Dick Barnes and I translated all of his poems, nearly, nearly 500 of them, uh, which may be the best work either of us <laughs> ever did. Um, they are, although we translate his rhyme and meter into English rhyme and meter, uh, we strove to be as faithful as possible. So all, all the translations I will read are pretty accurate. But I've taken, oh, three or four of his poems and adapted them to my own use. I stole them. <laughs> uh, T.S. Eliot said that great poets steal, so that, that may be my only claim to greatness. <laughs> uh, and this is one, this is an adaptation. Uh, he wrote an elegy for a youthful when, a friend of his when they were young poets together. And I've taken it over to celebrate and mourn uh, my friend Henry Coulette, um, another very fine poet, um, now almost forgotten. There, I, there's an allusion in the poem to the Herberts, uh, George and Zbigniew, and uh, most of you probably recognize that, them. In case not, George Herbert was a you know, great devotional poet, 17th century devotional poet, and Zbigniew Herbert, a great Polish poet, probably distantly related, actually. But, uh, after 10 years, Now that the sum of footsteps given you to walk upon the earth has been fulfilled, I say that you have died. I too have died. I who recall the very night we made our laughing, unaware farewells. I wonder what on earth has become of those two young men who sometime around 1957 would walk for hours oblivious of the snow that slashed around those street corners like knives under the lamps of that Midwestern town, or sit in bars talking about the women, or decades later stroll the perfumed streets of Pasadena talking about the meters. Brother in the felicities of the Herberts, George and Zbigniew, and of Shedda's Regal, and the warm rooms of the pentameter, discoverer, as we all were in those days, of that time-worn utensil metaphor. Henry, my tipsy, dip diffident old friend, if only you were here to share with me this empty dusk, however impossibly, and help me to improve these lines of verse. Also, uh, Borges. This is a, a not quite so freely adapted. It's I wouldn't call it exactly a translation, but it's, it's closer than, uh, than most of the uh, adaptations. Uh, Borges was always falling in love, and uh, uh, there, there were a number of them. And he wrote eloquently and uh, heartbreakingly about them. This is a poem called "The End." On a certain street, there is a certain door, unyielding, around which rock roses rise, charged with the scent of a lost paradise, which in the evening sunlight opens no more, or not to me. Once, in a better light, dearly awaited arms would wait for me, and in the impatient fading of the day, the joy and peace of the embracing night. No more of that. Now a day breaks and dies, releasing empty hours and impure fantasies and the abuse of literature, the lawless images and artful lies and pointless tears and the envy of other men and then the longing for oblivion. Uh, 
Borges, one of, one of his obsessions is oblivion. He wrote this, writes many poems about it, and we'll come back to that. Uh, it appears in some of my poems, too. Um, before I move on to the new poems, uh, my old friend Peter Everwine uh, is sharing this occasion with me, and uh, I want to read a poem or two from his book. Uh, most of you probably don't know his work, uh, or maybe his name, but uh, he's a lot, he's a better poet than most of the names you do know. Uh, and, uh, this is a beautiful book called From the Meadow, and I read two short poems. The first is called The Marsh, New Year's Day. The slow, cold breathing, black surf of birds lifting away, the light rising in the water's skip skirt. I'm sorry, let me begin again. The slow, cold breathing, black surf of birds lifting away, the light rising in the water's skin. How many times now, on a day like this, I've entered the celebration of the reeds, waking by the wren's broken house, the frosty burst phallus of the cattail. In the marsh, a door slams and slams. Wherever I look, I see the old men of my boyhood, wifeless and half wild, in stained canvas coats, dying like rainbows from the feet up. I am becoming them. And this next, next, next one is called The Wedding, uh, about his, his immigrant grandmother. The Wedding. She steps from the train into a town she can't pronounce. One man is dead. Now this one stands on the platform wearing a gray cap. She folds the letter again, the one she knows by heart, and follows him over a bridge. The river colors the stones yellow, almost the color of her hair. They enter the grocery store of Tony Maradon, Paisan, who has come before them. There, in the dress she's worn for days, with no blessings and no flowers, she marries him. She marries the garlic, the wine, the bags of salt, the dead rabbits hanging like bloody sleeves, the star of oil, the moon of bread. Pinota Castelnuovo. She never learns English. She attends many funerals. She herself dies, her house raised, her garden paved with cement. Only then does she enter America. you might know is I use the, the phrase tiring house it comes from a poem by Raleigh and it simply means uh, uh, the, the, the root of attire it's the dressing room the actors uh, are, go to a tiring house before the play begins another day to Ali it's Halloween again ooh very scary with the abyss which waits for all, the wary and the unwary, believer and infidel. 
For you, I know there's nothing at all scary about this. There's no abyss, no netherworld, no end. Only an interval, a gathering round. A sort of tiring house from which we go to what? Uh, here my imagination fails me. With or without wings, naked, shrouded, gowned, or disembodied consciousness, not mine. Mine is composed of earth and the things of earth, and every atom in my body tells me spirit and matter are one, and will decline together back to the darkness before birth. I will cease to be I. I will not know even the instant when my remnants meet blessed oblivion, infinitely forgiving, perpetual peace and silence and complete absence of pain. Now that's what I call living. Oblivion comes up in this one too. This is called to Julian. Uh, this was our grandchild uh, who died a couple of years ago at the age of two of leukemia, and this was uh, and this is an elegy for him. Part of it is uh, engraved on his stone. To Julian, there are no words can soften such a loss. All that survives of you, beloved boy, is gratitude that you are here with us and the overflowing memories of joy. For even as we grieve, we revel in your radiance and fearlessness and mirth, now warmly bosomed in oblivion to sleep forever in the sacred earth. Very short ones. Uh, this is another analogy. Under, when you get to a certain age, you're uh, obliged to write quite a lot of elegies. Uh, this is for my little sister who died too young uh, and whose life was hard. Inscription Life was for you the unfolding of a crime you could not solve but must be faithful to. You felt abandoned always, until time, which will solve everything, ran out on you. An accommodation. Come into my pallor, said the old man to the fly. Here's a little gift that you may open by and by. By then, it will mean less than nothing. I will not be I. Once I was too quick for you. To meet me was to die. Now I can but watch you as you pirouette on high. Soon I will have forgotten there was something called a fly. sublime poems, I think. It's called Luke 23. And that's just the scene of Jesus between the two thieves. And one of the thieves speaks to him, if you remember. Luke 23. Gentile or Hebrew or simply a man whose face is lost in time, we shall never redeem from oblivion the silent letters of his name. About mercy, he knew what a bandit can know whom Judea nails to a cross. Of time gone before, we can recover now nothing. 
during his final task to die crucified, he heard among the jibes of the people that the man crucified next to him was a god, and he blurted out, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The inconceivable voice that one day will judge all beings promised from the terrible cross, paradise. They said no more until the end came, but history won't let the memory of that afternoon when they both died, die. Oh, my friends, the innocence of this friend of Jesus, the openness that prompted him to ask for paradise and to obtain it out of the ignominy of his chastisement was the same that threw him down so many times into bloody calamity and crimes. Speaking of crimes, let me read uh, from the Malanga. Uh, Borges has a tremendous range, and uh, many, many different kinds of poems. Uh, and Malanga, is, Argentine Malanga, is the equivalent to our ballad. It's essentially very much the same thing. And like our ballads, celebrates men of courage, usually outlaws and no goods. This is the Malanga of Jacinto Chiclana. Uh, Borges grew up in, in a neighborhood that had once been the stomping grounds of the great knife fighters and gangsters of uh, the late 19th century. And uh, he was obsessed with them in a way, he admired their their courage. He felt himself, he felt he was, he was a bookish and timid, and he felt that he had, he had no physical courage. Uh, I think he did, but he, he had a, saw a wide gulf between him and his ancestors who had died on the field of battle and, on, and these knife fighters. Milonga of Jacinto Chiclana. I remember in Balvanera, one night, many years ago, someone mentioned Jacinto Chiclana, a name I didn't yet know. And some other things were mentioned, a street corner and a knife. The years have allowed us to witness that flashing of steel and strife. Who can say why that fellow's name seeks me out again and again? Maybe because I would love to know how it must have been with such men. I see him, tall and upstanding, as courtly a soul as can be, a soft-spoken man who would lightly put his life in jeopardy. No, no one ever trod the earth as staunchly as this senor. No one carried himself like that, either in love or in war. Above truck garden and patio loom Balvanera's dark spires, as on some desert. My, my computer does not like me. <laughs> and I've always thought that po poets' websites were awfully egotistical. Um, probably, you know, good publicity, but I don't, I don't have one, no. Well, it vary. Mostly, mostly it takes a long time, yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, a poem I published in my first book and then republished in another book and, and again in a third book. has been published in four different books, and every time I rewrote it as much as I could, and it's still not right. Uh, so that, that poem I spent uh, 1957, 50 years on. Uh, and still not enough time. Uh, sometimes, very rarely, they come quickly and easily, like a you know, baby slipping out without any labor. Uh, I, I once would, I, 
a poem about Hardy, the great poet Hardy, uh, came to me when I was on an airplane. And I think I wrote the first 12 lines in 10 minutes. I was, just, I was being dictated to and just copied them down. The last two lines took me seven or eight months. You never can tell. Uh, and the hard, one of the hard, I mean, it, it, I feel tremendously lucky uh, to have been able to spend my life in poetry. Um, uh, but there are hard parts of it, and one hard part is that however long you write, um, and however skillful and practiced you think you are, once you sit down to a new poem, you're a beginner again. You don't know anything. One, no. I mean, what, what, what is the difference? The way the poem moves you? Or? Yeah, well, the, the, yes, that's a large part of it. it uh, to, to a certain extent, taste is subjective. Uh, if you're dealing with good poetry on a certain level, you know, uh, people will respond differently to different. I mean, I acknowledge that uh, Shelley is probably a great poet, certainly a good one, but I can't bear him. <laughs> <laughs> Partly because I thought I hated his life and his good personality, but uh, and there are other poets that I react to that way. Um, but I thought it's not altogether subjective, and when a poem is really bad, you can show quite clearly why it's bad. And I, I do that with my students sometimes in class. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Isn't poetry, in a way, also the way it's recited? And the way it's recited? The way it's recited, the way it's how you, how you share it. Don't you find that that's to me a way well, well, that's part of it. I mean, and sometimes it's thrilling to hear a, a really good poet who reads well. Robert Frost, great example of that. Magnificent reader and presence. But it doesn't have much to do with the quality of the poems. Um, Elizabeth Bishop, a terrific poet, had her reading, I, I, I've only heard them on records, CDs, very dull, very, and she didn't have much to, the poems are much better on the page than in her reading, but she's a better poet than Della Thomas, who could read the hell out of his poems, and, you know, was a great performer. What is a good poem? <laughs> yeah, I'm enjoying everything thus far. Well, I, it, that's a question that could take up hours uh, to answer, and also it's, it's something very difficult, so I'm not sure that I would altogether know the answer. But there are some things I think that are vital, and uh, uh, Frost says in one of his notebooks, a poem is sound before it is anything. Uh, and sadly, that's something that's been forgotten in contemporary poetry. Uh, I have nothing against free verse. I think there are great poems in free verse, William Collis Williams and Wallace Stevens, among others. But free verse is very hard to write. Everybody writes what they think is easier. And it's kind of, it's good for democracy. Anybody can be a poet. There's nothing, there's no, no need any skill. Uh, but free verse as a norm seems to me grotesque. Uh, and most of the poems I read in the magazines or in class or wherever seem to me to have, not to be in verse at all, but prose broken into lines. They're typographically, they're poems. They can declare themselves as poems, but they're not poems. Uh, it doesn't have to be metrical. It doesn't have to be rhymed, although most of the great poetry in English is. But it has to, it has to move. It has to sound. It has to have a kind of rhythmical drive from beginning to end. Uh, Pound said once that uh, poetry atrophy, atrophies when it gets too far from music and the dance. Uh, hmm. 
I wish I'd brought, I wish I'd brought his book to read you a few of his poems, yes. Uh, I've been mentioning a number of poets who were not nearly as well known as they should be. Uh, I, myself, I, I think some great poets died uh, last year. I should have wiped out almost all the great poets in America. There were really good ones. Uh, Donald Justice died, and Tom Gunn died, Mona Van Dyne. Uh, Anthony Hecht, who was a terrible year. Uh, and when I look around at the, you know, the great celebrities in poetry now, I think almost all but one or two are hopelessly bad. Um, and um, uh, there's nothing I can do about that except to try to do, do good work myself. Um, and I know that many people might agree with that or agree, agree with me, but I'm I can't help that. Uh, so I, I think that's the, the, the most important thing, is, is the quality of the verse. Uh, there are even nonsense poems that are wonderful. I mean, some of Wallace Stevens' poems are impenetrable. Uh, I like clear, accessible poems myself, but when a poem is that beautiful, you can't complain. And it's partly because of the language is so rich and the movement is so beautiful. The sonority of it. Uh, that's crucial. Um, and as I say, I think accessibility and clarity is a virtue, it's a very minority opinion these days. Um, there are great poems that are not, but most of the great poems are. You don't have to get a PhD to read Hardy and enjoy it, understand most of it and enjoy it. Or George Herbert, or Frost, or almost any great poet. Uh, you don't need to study them in school to, to, to get the uh, pleasure out of it. And pleasure is what it's all about, uh, finally. Um, if you read something and it leaves you cold, what's the good of it? it may, you know, the person who wrote it may be very smart and have other virtues, but uh, I can... Uh, when I read the magazines, I don't do much, but I get a magazine, I read I read the first two or three lines of every poem. And if it's any, you know, that, if the, that grabs me and leads me on, well and good, but mostly I don't read more than three or four lines. Uh, once in a while, it's a wonderful poem by somebody I never heard of, but uh, sadly not very often. Um, there are a few younger poets whose work I admire very much. Um, but they're not very well known e either. Um, but I, I do urge you to, to, uh, to look at the, some of the po poets I've mentioned. I think they're really terrific poets, uh, although, as I say, not greatly celebrated. Don Justice, Street Corner, The Casual Death Transpires. I do not see them drawing blood, but I see them jolt and stagger. Two men or shadows under a lamp, and that poisonous snake, the dagger. Perhaps in that final moment, as he lay there, bleeding and shaking, he felt it did not become a man to drag out his leave-taking. Only God himself can know how steady and faithful a flame. Gentlemen, I am saying to you what is summed up in the name. Among the thousand things there are, and thousands of ways to behave, there's one thing no one ever regrets, and that is having been brave. Yes, courage is always the finest thing, and hope in a man of honor. Go on your way then, little Malanga, and praise Jacinto Chiclana. scary sometimes, he uh, often scared himself in some of these poems. This is called, You Are Not Other Men. And it mentions Christ and Socrates and also Siddhartha, the Buddha. You are not other men. 
They will not save you, those from whom you sought some help, no, nor the writings they left behind. You are, that, you are not other men, and now you find you are the center of the labyrinth wrought by your own footsteps. Neither the last breath of Christ or Socrates, nor the deified golden Siddhartha, who, unresisting, died at day's end in a garden, saves you from death. Dust like all that, whatever words you write, and dust as well the pitiful words you say. Fate will have no pity anyway, and God's night is an everlasting night. You are made up of time, and you are in it. You are each single solitary minute. This is a, a rather tender poem, uh, like, like the one I just read, a sonnet. Borges wrote, oh, 80 or 90 sonnets. Um, loved the form and performed beautifully in it. Uh, this is called To a Minor Poet of 1899. Uh, and like that Donald Justice painting, uh, it, it, uh, 1899 is the year that Borges was born. So I think he's... Uh, speaking to an, an imaginary version of himself, but perhaps not, to a minor poet of 1899. To leave behind a verse for that sad hour that watches us at day's edge, lying in wait. To affix your signature to its grievous date of gold and shadow, that was your desire. With what passion, as twilight deepened, you would labor over the peculiar verse that till the extinction of the universe would manifest the hour's peculiar blue. I don't know if you ever managed it, my ghostly brother, or if you existed even, but I am lonesome, and I wish oblivion could give back to the days your delicate shadow that it might live in the warm shell of words in which the blues of evening dwell. Yeah. Another of those poems uh, drawn more from my life than I used to do. This is a, called A Glimpse of Bo Jack. And, uh, as with the tea dance, I think most of you are much too young to remember who Bo Jack was. Uh, he was a, a famous prize fighter who flourished in the 40s and 50s. Uh, he was a lightweight champion at 20. And most of his career, he, fo he fought bigger men, welterweights and middleweights, because lightweights didn't want to get in the ring with him. And Bo, Bo Jack, B, Bo is spelled B-E-A-U. Beautiful. And the arena, which I mentioned, we lived within a few blocks of the arena. In those days, boxing was a big, big deal. Many, many passionate fans. And the arena was one of the great venues. A glimpse of Bo Jack. Philadelphia, 1946. Night. My father and I are walking home along the pavement breaked by swirling snowflakes whenever the wind kicks up. Having just emerged from under the bean shadows of the L, we cross to the arena heading home to mashed potatoes, sisters, downcast eyes, anger, and sullen silence. Past the wall, in which a door stands open, and I see in luminous blackness hundreds of black shapes, heads and shoulders, the sides of faces silvered by swirls of smoke, the embers of cigars glowing an instant and then blacking out. 
far off in the black depths, the source of light, the canvas square of ring circled by cliques, and a slim brown man who has a bigger man pinned on the ropes, digging blood-red gloves methodically like a man chopping wood into his ribs, the white skin splotching pink. Could I have seen at this distance the rocking and ripple of muscle under the bronze skin, or did I just imagine all of this? It couldn't have been much more than a second. My father was a very impatient man, but there it is, as radiant as just now. My arm was jerked hard. I was dragged away, wondering desperately who the man was. Then there he was on a poster, fists cocked, poised, smiling behind his gloves. I have forgotten the name of his opponent, but not his name. I loved him, and I wondered what he had. Not the jewel belt, the title, money, fame. What could they mean to an 11-year-old? No, what I wanted was the pride and power, prowess and speed and grace, and even more, fearlessness in the face of bigger men. And that most beautiful of names, Go Jack. about uh, the love life uh, in one way or another. Um, the first one is called An Encounter in the Hate. And again, I think you're probably too young to know it. The Hate, hate Ashbury, part of San Francisco, uh, which was the center of the counterculture in the 60s. And uh, just overrun with hippies and uh, and the, the Summer of Love was held there in 1968, and uh, it was it was something weird. <laughs> <laughs> An encounter in the hate, circa 1968. Uh, I mentioned a bar called the Double Take. There's no such bar in San Francisco. I just invented the name because I liked it and needed a rhyme. <laughs> An encounter in the hate. What were they, after all? Birds of a feather? Two poets of distinctly minor make. Whiskey and chance had bundled them together in San Francisco at the double take. She bit his neck and giggled in his ear. She had the thing desired, such as it is. He checked his watch. She finished off her beer and grinned, mixing her drunken breath with his. There was a spare room in a nearby house where an old friend he knew would not deny him, and there they steered post-haste. Nor did he guess how soon, how long this act would mortify him. But now he would not stop for anything. Their clothes were scattered all across the floor. His will was bent to his unburdening, beyond amendment, needless to say more. And what of her? By now she barely stirred, a sign perhaps her ardor had diminished. Her eyes were closed. She did not say a word. Not that it would have mattered. He was finished. Poor body, that for a fugitive desire courts such humiliation and self-loathing. Was it for this they grappled in the mire and shamed themselves? For this they tore their clothing? Those blind lusts, though it was not so much lust as the attraction of two emptinesses, embraced goodbye with delicate disgust brushing aside the customary kisses. 
Outside, the wind blew. It was cold and wet. The bars were closing. Lust, which conquers all, had caught these writhing creatures in his net. The summer of love was over. It was fall. rather different one, but also a sort of acid, acidic, uh, called with a ten-foot pole. And, um, pre not pre not as, as uh, perhaps at first accessible or, or clear as most of my poems are or I try to make them, but I, I think uh, it comes through well enough. With a ten-foot pole, the sky is white and nerveless and involves standing off at a ludicrous distance, thinking bad thoughts. Well, not bad really, rather say homeless. Images of a time and place long since scattered to dust. But still, what power? My dearest wish, but one shouldn't have wishes. Wishes are horses that kick you in the heart, then ask you if you'd like another ride. I rode one once, or let's say she rode me, but you don't want to hear that story again. I know I don't. Maybe you'd like to hear about a time and place that kept their distance. The sky was white and nerveless. Leave it at that. This is a real love poem, uh, Ghazal to the One. Ghazal is a, the, probably the most uh, prevalent and important form in uh, Urdu, Arabic, Persian poetry. Uh, it's a poem of couplets with one rhyme that goes all the way through. And instead of rhyme, I'm, I use a a repeated phrase or word all the way through. And they're almost always love poems.
to the one. Sun's bliss, leaf shadows, a honeyed breeze, the world as he would have it be for you, your faithful, humble, and obedient servant, one who has no other goddess before you. The name, the guest, the beloved are all one, and he, vouchsafe that, that vision once, bows down before you. The blessings of friends, the gratitude of children, the work of your hands, a table spread before you. A fantasy he blushes to mention, the desire to rearrange time since and time before you. Another not so foolish, he'll wait for you when he reaches that river bank as he supposes before you. This is a tiny poem, and uh, I don't know what to make of it. Sometimes I think I love it, and it's wonderful. Other times I can't stand to look at it. <laughs> it's called Now and Then. And I had in mind I had certain lyrics in the Greek anthology, the poems written, oh, 2,500 years ago or more. Uh, now and Then. Never again the drunkenness of youth, the taste of life then was almost too sweet. And she lay beside me in the night. I was so happy then I was willing to die. Now that death is near, I am afraid, now that I have so little left to lose. Most of my poems are very short. Let me read one somewhat longer one. Um, it's called, I Know You, Orpheus. Um, and for those of you who are, don't know or have forgotten, uh, Orpheus was the great arch poet. And he's the myth mythology of ancient Greece. And he, uh, uh, the trees would bow, lower their branches uh, when he played and sang his songs, and stones would melt. Uh, he was married very happily to Eurydice, whom he adored, and one day uh, she was crossing the field, and some guy, I won't go into detail, but some guy tried to rape her, and so she ran. And as she ran, uh, she was barefoot. Uh, a serpent bit her the heel, and she died. Orpheus was beside himself. He went down to the underworld, down the steep path, long, long journey to the underworld. And he, at the river Styx, he played and sang his songs. And the thousands of shades gathered round, whatever was left of those many dead, in wonderment at this song. And then he went before Hades, the king, the lord of the underworld, and the queen, Persephone, and begged for his wife back. And uh, amazingly, his wish was granted, but with a strange provision. I, I sometimes think it was Penelope who thought up this malicious thing. Uh, they said, you can take her back to the world, but you must not look back until you get all the way up. Otherwise she disappears and comes back to death. And although this is, a, you know, a, 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 I think the only poem I've ever written about a, a Greek myth or any myth, um, and in some ways very distant, it, uh, it's a, in some ways a very personal poem. I know you, Orpheus. 
Not that he ever thought that he could lose her, or dreamt for a breath it lay within his power. But as he climbed the steep and rock-strewn path, his whole being charged with the God's command. An icy terror encased his heart, as if he could foresee the future and were not a stranger to himself. And gods can lie. No, banish all such thoughts and fix your eyes on the gray dust and gray rocks at your feet. And so he did. He forced himself to think of nothing but the next thrust upward, then the next foothold, the next, the next insuck of air. Yet all the while, the thing forbidden grew, was working in him, spreading through his veins as the snake's venom had worked in his young wife. The snake, he had almost forgotten it. How could she follow, foot sore, clambering over the rocks, up the forbidding path, hour after hour, without food or water, who had so recently been drained of life? He made himself look everywhere, except where he most had to. Mostly he gazed up at the bright distant rim of the ravine, the ribbon of blue sky where the real world lay all before them, if she lived again. He strained to hear a footfall, a stone dislodged, just silence and the cold breeze following. He imagined bushes swept by a mute wind, swaying reeds, the vacant path descending. All he could think of was her slender arms embracing him in darkness, her soft hands that brushed against his cheek or held his manhood, and her brown eyes that saw him as he was. It was all he could do to keep from weeping, not seeing her, not knowing if she followed was more than he could bear. And yet, he bore it, telling himself that she was just behind him and not believing it. No, not for a second. What would you do if it were your beloved? You would be sick and stricken dumb with grief, the bone-deep grief that even now brought tears and words words and phrases. His pulse quickened as if he had looked back already, lines entering him like arrows from the distance, line after line, till he no longer knew whether the tears that filled his eyes were the grief or pleasure in the sounds they summoned forth. A song to soften stone and sweeten the air, and bring the lark and nightingale to listen and marvel. Never afterward was he able to say what he was thinking at that moment. Now he looked up again and saw the trees in sunlight, the path widening, then lost on the last slope. Now he was almost there. Suddenly he was in sunlight. A mad elation flowed through him. With one last push to the top, they were home free. But what if they were not? If she were not? Orpheus, don't look back. His gamble had become unbearable. Surely now, after so many hours, with his eyes fixed steadfastly on the future, surely now, with the shining crest in sight, barely a stone's throw from the Spartan gates. He had come face to face with himself. Now he had nowhere to turn, and so he turned, stopped, turned, as if against his will, as if he were a character in a poem. He turned abruptly and looked back at her, the dead shock in her eyes, her shoulders hunched, as if to ask, ask what? And saw her hand lifted to bid farewell, already withered. Well, one or two 
short ones and called uh, a day, a night. Uh, maybe one more Borges poem. Uh, This one is called Einar Tamberskelver. If you read the, his name, you know, appears in, the, in the, the Nordic epics, the sagas, the Eddas. Uh, a luminous name, Einar Tamberskelver. And this, this, the story of the poem is, is from one of the sagas called Heims Kringla, and he gives the line, the verse. Uh, there's a word Christomathes appears in the poem not exactly an anthology but if you think of it as an anthology you're close enough um, Einar Tamberskelver Odin or Thor or the white Christ they matter little the names the gods behind them there is no other duty than to be brave, and Einar, leathery captain of men, was that. He was foremost among the Norwegian archers, and expert in the handling of the, of the blue sword and of ships. Of his trajectory through time, there now remains to us one sentence, which gives off light in the Christomathes. He said it in the din of a sea battle, the lost days fighting done, the starboard, aisle, starboard side open to boarding, a last shot snapped his bow. The king asked what was that that he heard breaking behind his back, and Einar Tamberskelver replied, Norway, my lord, between your fingers. Centuries later, Someone saved the story in Iceland, and I now transcribe it here, so distant from those oceans, from that spirit. And let me end with a poem called Endings. Endings. If the winter comes to stay, how much then will north wind weigh? What is pitiable and thin, yet still locks the city in? What does autumn think of death now, and what has lost its breath, hunting through each cancelled square a brief whiteness in the air? When the mist had rolled away, was there nothing left to say? to the gathering vacancy. Was there any word of me? Janoska, uh, was that her name? Something like that. Uh, she's, a good, she's a pretty good poet, too, but she said also, why, why didn't you go to Herbert? He's our great poet. Uh, this is, uh, I translated this with a friend who's a native speaker and knows a lot about poetry and, in fact, knew Herbert well. Uh, 
Um, I don't think need, anything needs to be explained. You, you probably, some of you, I know, must have been to the, the Redwoods and seen that huge stump you know, with all the circles and all the rings with dates on them. Uh, Herbert taught for a semester at L.A. State, and uh, I had the good luck to drive him from L.A. to San Francisco. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure it was on this trip that he, that he then went to see the Redwoods and that stump. Um, sequoia. Actually, it's the stump of the Sequoia. Sequoia. Gothic spires of needles in the valley of the stream, not far from Mount Tamopias, where morning and evening dense fog breathes the elation or rage of the ocean. On display in this reservation of giants, a cross section of a tree, the coppery stump of the west, with vast concentric rings like ripples on water on which some cross-grained fool has carved the dates of history. An inch from the center, Nero looks down at burning Rome. Farther out, the Battle of Hastings, the longboats moving in darkness, the panic of the Saxons, the death of the ill-starred Herald, all laid bare by a pair of compasses. And finally, nearing the coast of the bark, the Normandy landing. The Tacitus of this stump was a geometer. He didn't know words. He lacked the grammar of havoc. He lacked epithets. And so he counted, added years and centuries, as if to say there's nothing, nothing beyond birth and death, just birth and death, and between them, the bleeding pulp of the sequoia. Mm -hmm. Dave Clemens has asked if I would, you know, if there are any questions about whether I would answer them. Uh, you don't, don't feel obliged to ask, but if you, if you have one, I'll, I will try. Some questions don't have answers. Where are you next teaching? Mm -hmm. Where do you teach? Where do I teach? Well, I Where? retired. I retired. I taught at Pomona for about 25, 26 years. And I retired from Pomona um, about six, seven years ago. Uh, and I teach very, very, very infrequently. I wish you know, they taught a little more because I like to. to get together with young people sometimes, but um, I, I taught a course um, at USC this fall and did one there last, last fall, uh, graduate course for poets. Um, I had a more selfish question in mind here. When's the next time you're teaching or is there a website where we can go and look? My website? Yeah, do you have one? Or no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, 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 I, no sunglasses? Just, one, Henry Coulette, Peter Everwine, um, and there are a, a few others. Um, I don't think you can trust celebrity in the poetry world at all. You sort of have to follow your nose. And if you enjoy it, that's, that's, that's all necessary. Some people enjoy bad poetry, but there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> And I, I didn't read any of my comment poems. Uh, I published a bunch, and against the advice of friends who said, you, you, know, you shouldn't publish your comment poems because then people will think you're not serious. It's bizarre, but... Uh, uh, but I've written a lot of comic verse, and I love doing it, and a number of poets have. And there are... You know, sometimes that, that's all a poet, a poem is good for, is the, the, the pleasure of the comic and the laugh. Uh, one of my favorite poems is an anonymous poem from the 1930s, I think it was. Carnation milk is the best in the land. I have a can, can of it here in my hand. 
No tits to pull, no hate to pitch. He just punch a hole in the son of a bitch. 